Let's go to the Lord in prayer, thanking Him and getting ourselves ready for His Word. Father, we thank You for Your goodness, Your grace, Your kindness, Your glory, and Your transforming acts, redemptive acts in transforming the sinful people. Father, we pray that your word will go forth out and into the hearts of the people who are here. They will be received. That the soil will be ready. And that the seed of the gospel and of Christ will bear fruit. Help me to speak in truth, clarity, boldness, and holiness. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. The last week, we saw the gem of the gospel. We saw the verse, Mark 10, verse 45, that, that can be considered and has been considered one of the summary statements of the gospel. And it is also probably the summary statement of the gospel according to Mark. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve And to give his life a ransom for many. Uh, After having analyzed and studied and received that verse. We now come to the section that comes before it. And the section that actually the verse supports. That it grounds. It gives strength to. That is the passage for this morning. Chapter 10 of the Gospel according to Mark, verses 32 to 45, we will read the whole context. The title of today's message is Servant Kings, born out from the servant king. Mark 10, verse 32. They were on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking on ahead of them, And they were amazed, and those who followed were fearful. And again he took the twelve aside and began to tell them what was going to happen to him, saying, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, and will hand him over to the Gentiles. They will mock him and spit on him and scourge him and kill him, And three days later, he will rise again. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? They said to him, Grant that we may sit, one of your right and one of your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? Or to be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized? They said to him, we are able. And Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink, you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism with which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left, this is no mine to give. But it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We come to the last week of life of our Lord Jesus Christ. The most remarkable week in the life of world history. Remember that the gospel in this Bible speaks about truth in history. Historical accounts. And we come so to the last week of life of our Lord Jesus Christ. On his week up to Jerusalem, on the week where he will enter the holy city, in the week where he will be crucified, 
and at the end of the week he will rise again. It is a most remarkable week. Three years of ministry leading to this moment. Few thousands of history leading to this moment. And thousands of, he, of history after this moment looking back to this moment. Brothers and sisters, we enter into a most crucial, pivotal, important, remarkable week of the life and the history of the world. And it begins with Jesus and his disciples going up to Jerusalem. From, from verse 1, chapter 10, we know, of course, we are now in the region of Judea. And it is at this point that the Lord Jesus Christ starts making his way up to Jerusalem. According to how you read the Gospel of John, this will be either his second time or his first time entering into the holy city, approaching the holy city. A time that the disciples understood was important, crucial. They had never been there with Jesus. But this was only the second time that they would be there after three years of ministry. And so they understood that something was up. Something was going to happen. A most important moment was coming. And see how the very way that Jesus was walking caused, stirred up affections, fear, awe within the hearts of those who were following him. Verse 32, Jesus was walking on ahead of them, leading the crowds, and they were amazed, probably speaking about the disciples. And, and those who followed were fearful, likely speaking about the crowds. Two groups, two different reactions but caused by the same event, observing the way that this Christ, that this Jesus was walking toward Jerusalem. And so we got to ask the question, what was that caused the disciples and the crowds to have this reaction? In what way was Jesus walking? How is it that the very way that Jesus walked caused fear and amazement? This is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 7. In a context of the sufferings of the Messiah, in a context of foretold suffering, the Messiah speaks. The voice of the Christ is heard and he says, I have set my face like flint. The very way that Jesus walked. The intentionality of this man toward that moment. A man with a mission. Causes disciples to be amazed. This was quite the sight. And so this makes sense then why the disciples will come and ask him that question later on. But let's stay in our first heading. Which is the surprising teaching. So we are toward Jerusalem. Jesus is leading the expedition. That causes, it stirs up amazement and fear. But then all of a sudden, there were the disciples expecting a most important moment going up to the city of King David. The Lord Jesus Christ gives them teaches them something that is surprising to them, that they will not yet understand, but that they need to hear. Verse 33. Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem. So far, so good. <laughs> we know that, Lord. But it's what comes to later that shocks the disciples. This is the third time that the Lord Jesus Christ will prophesy, will foretell about his sufferings. We even mentioned last week that in chapter 8 of Mark, verse 31, in Caesarea Philippi, the Lord Jesus for the first time announces his suffering and his death to the disciples. In chapter 9, verse 31, in Galilee, in the birthplace of our Lord, 
That is where, for the second time, our Lord Jesus announces his suffering to the disciples. And now we are close. Close to the mountain of the holy city. Close to the mountain of the temple. Close to the throne of David. And for the third time and final time, the Lord Jesus will prophesy about his suffering and death. But why Jerusalem? Why this city? The Lord Jesus, of course, knew that this was the capital. This was the capital of Israel. This was the capital of ancient Israel. This was the place that about a thousand years before our Lord walked into or on the dust of Palestine, about a thousand years before that moment, King David conquered that city and made it the capital of the new nation, of the new kingdom that was entrusted to him by God. And so this was the city of the king, city of King David, the same David who received the promise in 2 Samuel 7 that a son from his loins will sit on his throne and reign forever, whose kingdom will know no end. This is the same capital of that king. This is the city of peace, Jerusalem, the city where God and men met, the city where the problem of sin will be dealt with. Where the mountain of the temple stood. This is the city where the kings of Israel are enthroned. But this is not only the royal city. This is not only the capital city. This is also the city that kills the prophets. Luke 13 verse 34. The Lord looking at Jerusalem says. Oh Jerusalem, Jerusalem. The city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her. The city that was supposed to receive the king of glory and the messengers of God is the very city that stones one prophet after another, after another. Why? Because they have rebelled against their God. And so it was proper that the Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet like Moses, prophesied in Deuteronomy 18, the king that was prophesied in Deuteronomy 17, the son of David and the last ultimate great prophet will be crowned in Jerusalem with a crown of thorns bearing on him the curse of the earth and receiving scorn, enduring suffering and being killed by the hands of his people. It is a most remarkable place. In the place where most likely Abraham sacrificed his son. Where Abraham said, Of the mountain of the Lord it shall be provided. A lamb like the sacrifices were, was offered. But now the Lord foretells for the third time his sufferings. And there are a few observations to make. The first is that there are three actors in his sufferings. And the, se- and the second is that there are seven injustices that he experiences. Three actors and seven injustices. But first we need to understand who are the actors. First of all, look at verse 33. We are going after Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be delivered to the chief priest. Here the first actor. And we have to ask, who is he? Is he God or is someone else? Because this could be a passive, a divine passive. Namely, that God is behind, is implied to be behind the action. Look at verse 40. That is an example of divine passive. It is, not, it is uh, to sit on my right or my left. It is no mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Prepared by whom? By God. So the question is, is it God behind this handing over of Jesus in verse 33? Or is someone else? And I think that the gospel mark points to someone else. 
Because the other times, this word, this word can be translated either as handing over, delivered, or as being betrayed. It's the same word, can be translated both times, in both ways. And this word appears in connection of Judas Iscariot. In chapter 3, verse 19, we are told that Judas Iscariot was the one who betrayed him. Same word, same word. Then we are told in chapter 14, verse 20, verse 18, that this is at the Lord's Supper, uh, at the Last Supper, and the Lord says, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, same word, one who is eating with me. And then verse 21, the Son of Man is to go just as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Once again pointing to Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Christ. So I think that most likely here, the Lord Jesus refers to Judas. The betrayal, the betrayer, the one who betrayed him. And it will make sense, we will see also, because this will be the fulfillment of a prophecy given in Psalm 41, verse 9. But the Son of Man is betrayed by Judas, by one of his friends, one of the twelve. Not even one of the seventies. The Lord Jesus has a great many disciples following him. There were the twelve, the seventy, the crowds. But this is one of the twelve who betrays him. And then this is the first actor. And then who is the second actor? The chief priest and the scribe who will condemn him. The leaders of his nation. And who are the third? The Gentiles. So you see how this concentric betrayal and injustice goes on. From the closest circle, from the closest relationship of our Lord, from one of his closest friends, to the leaders of his nation who were supposed to receive him and, and crown him with a crown of glory, and then to the Gentiles, the rest of the world, represented by the Roman Empire. Every single one involved in the killing of the Son of Man. And friends, let me tell you that if we, were, if we would have been there, we would have been among them. No one received this Christ. Even his disciples left him. I don't think that we are better than them. If we were there, we would also have been one among these circles. And so the universality of the sufferings of the Lord, from his friend to his leaders to the nations. But then look at the seven injustices. Betrayal. Unjust condemnation, judged by foreign authorities, mockery, shame, flagellation, capital punishment. Seven injustices mentioned here as to speak that the Lord Jesus Christ endured all kinds of suffering that we can imagine. And these were for the fulfillment, they, they, all these injustices fulfilled prophecies in the Old Testament. Psalm 41, verse 9, even my closest friend has lifted up his heel against me, Judas. Psalm 22, verse 7, all who see me sneer at me, mockery by everybody. Isaiah 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who strike me and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. Isaiah 53, verse 8, he was cut off from the land of the living. And therefore, it is not surprising that Peter and the message of Pentecost in Acts 2, verse 23, he will say, This man delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, that you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. It was part of the God's divine plan, prophesied in the Psalms, in Isaiah, hundreds of and even thousands of years before the Lord Jesus came. And so you see how everything, then he said, everything concerning the Son of Man must be fulfilled. And it happened 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And so it is surprising then 
Imagine yourself receiving this teaching from the Lord Jesus Christ, being one of the disciples, hearing for the third time that he must suffer and endure many things, and then have, having the audacity to ask what James and John ask after that. The surprising request following the surprising teaching. Verse 35 to 40. Now, James and John were part of the inner group of our Lord Jesus Christ. He had the 12 disciples, and then he had the core group, the three, James, John, and Peter. So James and John, also called sons of thunder, always ready for action, they were ready. They didn't hear anything that the Lord Jesus Christ had to say about sufferings. They were ready about glory. We are close to Jerusalem. There is a throne. Christ is human. He has only two hands. So we better sit one at the right and one at the left. Sorry, Peter. You're left behind. James and John, the two sons of Zebedee. You say, how in the world is it true? I mean, have you heard what he just said? But they say, grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. In the 1500s, during the Reformation period, you know how Martin Luther was greatly used by God to stir up the flame of the Reformation. And he came to realize that what he calls there are two different kinds of theologies. A theology that he calls a theology of glory and one that he calls a theology of the cross. And the theology of the glory is a self-fulfilling, self-serving Self-strengthening theology. It's a theology that sees glory as, only, as being the first step and then seeing ourselves as being able to reach that step. But to that, he compares the theology of the cross by which sufferings precedes glory and by which sacrifice precedes exaltation and by which sinners are humbled under the hand of God. And it is remarkable that that theology of glory was not invented by, of seen for the first time by Luther, but was the theology that James and John and all the disciples had back then in first century Palestine. Why? Because of two things. First, because they ask and they can only think about earthly glory right now. And second, because they believe that they are able to endure sufferings. Verse 39 the Lord Jesus says, are you able to drink the cup? Are you able to be baptized? We are able. No hesitation. No hesitation. They were self-reliant. No understanding that still the teaching of the Lord Jesus then in chapter 14 of the Gospel of John. Apart from me, you can do nothing, James and John. Sons of thunder, calm down. So the surprising request after the surprising teaching, it is remarkable that they will come to ask this thing, to think in terms of glory only, and not understanding that the Christian life, it is a path of suffering. Why? Because the Lord also told him in Mark 8, whoever wants to come after me and follow me, whoever wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me, right? It's a path of self-denial. But they could not understand it. The Spirit had not yet been given. And their eyes were not open. I see what the Lord Jesus responds. It's a surprising response to the surprising request. Because in a Jesus-like fashion, He doesn't answer with an answer. He answers with a question. And He says... First of all, you have no idea what you're talking about. He corrects them right then. He had to correct their thinking. Then he asked them, are you able to drink the cup or be baptized? Now, what are those, what, what does that mean? What does he's pointing to with the cup and the baptism? Well, both symbols are signs of suffering. In Matthew 14, the Lord Jesus will pray to his father, Lord, let this cup pass from me talking about his sufferings, talking about the judgment of God. 
And the idea of baptism is an idea of passing through the waters of judgment, being overwhelmed with the waters of judgment, being crushed. And so the Lord Jesus is basically asking the disciples, are you able to suffer for my sake? Knowing in the same exact way that Jesus suffers, that is kind of the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church, where sufferings earn salvation. That is not the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, because his sufferings were atoning sufferings. Our sufferings are curative sufferings. As John Newton put it, our Lord's suffering, the Lord's suffering were punitive. Sin was punished through his sufferings. Our suffering are curative. They heal us of our sin, of our self-reliance, James and John, and of our wrong expectation that in this life we will experience the great heights of glory. Oh, praise the Lord for those moments of glory and for those victories of the church. And we pray for them, don't we? Revival in the land, we pray for it. We long for it. Because we long for our Lord to be exalted. But brothers and sisters, we realize, and it doesn't, come very, it doesn't take very long when you're in your Christian life to realize, boy, sufferings come before glory. Glory is coming. Glory is coming. The sufferings is, are now. They, in fact, work out glory for us. And so, James and John will experience the cup and the baptism. James will be killed by the grandson of Herod the Great who sought the life of Jesus. And John will live, out, will live into his old age by spending his last years in exile in the island of Patmos and dying an old age with all the sicknesses and the pains of an aging man. And so they endured that. They knew what suffering was. But we come now to the reaction of the apostles, the other apostles. Because if it is remarkable, first we have a remarkable teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ approaching Jerusalem and telling them, I'm not going to be crowned in glory. I'm going to be crowned in suffering. And then after that teaching, we have the remarkable response, a request of James and John, not understanding anything what the Lord has said and asking for glory. Now we have a remarkable response by the disciples and a remarkable teaching following the response. Hearing this, verse 41, the ten began to feel indignant with James and John. Now there's a sense in which you can expect and you, you would imagine, yeah, that would be the right response. James, John, are you serious? But is it what they were thinking? I don't think so. I don't think that they were indignant because James and John got to ask that question, but because they got to ask it first. Uh, let me prove it to you. First of all, this word indignant is a very strong word. It is used with, with the word, it is used with our Lord Jesus right before, still in chapter 10, in verse 14, when the disciples are hindering the children from coming to Jesus, and Jesus saw it, and he was indignant. So it's a strong word. But then let me show you that the disciples indeed had a spirit of contention that dwelt among them. A spirit of contention. Chapter 9, verse 33. Right after the, uh, right after the uh, second time that Jesus announces his sufferings to the disciples, we read, they didn't understand this statement. They were afraid to ask him. They came to Capernaum. And when he was in the house, he began to question them. What were you discussing on the way? They kept silent. Usually when you do not answer a question, you know you're in trouble. <laughs> they kept silent. Did you have to ask, Lord? For on the way, they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. 
Brothers and sisters, this was not an isolated moment. This was not an isolated scene of James and John, just the two worst disciples, the two most prideful disciples, the two most stupid disciples that could understand the word of Jesus. No, it was a spirit of contention, the pride, the sin that dwelt among all the 12 apostles. And let me ask you now, is it not the spirit of contention often present among Christians too? When we strive against one another, we fight against one another, we compete against one another, oh, we may put the nice Christian face, but then in our heart we're really striving to lord over our brother or sister. I'll show you who is best in ministry. I'll show you who sings the best song. I'll show you who serves the most. I'll show you who has the best house. I'll show you who has the best car. I'll show you who buys the best clothes to my wife. And so on and so forth. I'll show you whose children behave better. I'll show you who reads the Bible the most. And so on and so forth. A spirit of contention among Christians and among churches, I'll show you which church is the best. Oh, brothers and sisters, we are always prone to that. If the disciples walk in three years, face to face, side by side, eating and drinking, hearing every single day the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ had after three years at the end of the ministry, not the beginning, at the end, after they had performed miracles, after they had been sent out, after they preached, after they performed miracles, now let's count who has done the most. There is a danger that the more we serve, the more we're prone to compare ourselves with others. And that should have no place in the Christian life. Pride, contention should have no place in the Christian life. Because it shows a heart that wants to lord over others. It is not a heart that wants to serve. It's a heart that wants to be served. And therefore it was necessary for our Lord Jesus Christ to correct the thinking of his disciples. Verse 42. Calling them to himself. How patient. How patient. He was preparing himself to endure the worst sufferings that every human being has ever endured. And he had the patience to deal with 12 children acting men, competing with one another. Boys playing with toys, who has the bigger truck. What patience. Calling them to himself, Jesus said to them, you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them. There are certain statements, there are certain things that you need to prove to others. As Christians, we have, we need to give a reason for the hope that is in them. But there are other statements, they are self-evident. And this is one of those. Our Lord Jesus is saying, it is evident to you. You can recognize who are the rulers, the first, and who are the greatest among the Gentiles, among those who rule in the world. Why? Just because of how you look, the way they act. You know that those who are recognized, seen as rulers of the Gentiles, lord it over them. And their great men exercise authority over them. But it is not this way among you, brothers and sisters. But whoever wishes to become great, like the grand men in the world, shall be your servant. Wait on the tables. Diakonos. Wait on the table. Serving. Cleaning up the mess. And whoever wishes to be first, like the rulers, Archos, first, first, shall be slave of all. Brothers and sisters, the teaching of our Lord is remarkable. He's 
telling to the disciples what they know already. It is evident, and we see it nowadays. You want to know who is the boss of a company? Or is the one to whom everyone else obeys? And say, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Is the one who gives order. You want to know who is the president in a nation? Is the one who gives order. You want to know who is a king in a nation? Is the one who gives order all the time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. By saying you do want to know who are the greatest in the church? They are those who quietly serve others. Are those who are happy and joyful to clean up the mess of a potluck in a week from now and being quiet and knowing that your God sees in the secret and that you need no recognition from men. You want to know who is the first in the church? Is the one who is ready to give his life every single day for the sake of others, to put others before himself, to place others before him. The great in the church as those that we recognize are those that serve others, are those that make others success their own goal and who they delight to serve. Does this take away leadership? No, it doesn't. There was one leader among all those 13 men, and that was Jesus Christ. <laughs> was one leader, and that was Jesus Christ. Who was the greatest servant of all? Jesus Christ. Server servanthood does not negate leadership, but leadership is not lording over others. It is serving others. And if you always need to assert yourself that you're a great leader, that this is my role, that this is my job, well, let me tell you, you're not really, you're not really secure of your position. A dog that always needs to bark is an afraid dog. And so, brothers and sisters, this is the extraordinary teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Giddert, a commentator, is right when he says, the disciples, after all, this is the upside-down logic of the kingdom. You want them to be first? Be least. <laughs> what? How does that work? I just trust in the Lord. And it works out that way. Giddert is right. He says, the disciples are not consigned to last place. They are shown how they can be first. They are not consigned to slavery status. They are shown how to become great. Because that's what he said to them. You want to be great, be last. But how do we ultimately know that that is the case? We know it because verse 45 is... The verse that we have loved last week and that is grounds everything else in this teaching. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. You see how gospel truths are tightly connected with Christian living. Justification, you're justified by the sufferings and by the work of Christ. Justification is the ground for your sanctification. You are made right in the sight of God, and now you ought to act like one of that. Saved by Christ, now start acting like Him. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. You want to know what Christian leadership looks like? It looks like receiving the bullet for others. It looks like placing yourself in front of others and saying, stay behind me, not because I tell you what to do. I'm going to protect you. That is what leadership is. You lead by example. Brothers and sisters, you lead by example. And that is what the Lord Jesus said. They will know you. They will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. James 13. 1 John verse 4. Do not love only in word but in deeds and truth. You want to show your 
king to be great, act like him. Serve your brothers and sisters. And so, beacon of hope, brothers and sisters, serve one another in the Lord. If there must be a spirit of contention in this church, let it be the contention of outdoing one another and showing honor. Romans 12, verse 10. Outdo one another in showing honor. Place your, the other before you, Philippians 2. Have the same mindset of Christ. Who, although he was God, he did not consider that something to be grasped, but empty himself by taking the form of a servant. Serving his brothers and sisters. Leaders and elders of Beacon of Hope. You have been entrusted with a great task as a fellow co-worker in the great task of shepherding the flock of God. Oh, I know what responsibility the Lord has given us and how do we fail every single day. But my fellow brothers, do not shepherd this flock in the way of the world. I've heard last week two examples of friends of mine who are out of churches because of this problem. Serving in leadership and others were lording over them. The spirit of lordship and contention even among elders must not be present, brothers. Strive to keep the unity that Christ has purchased for you. And remember that you are under shepherds, 1 Peter 5, and when the great shepherd will appear, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. If you have shepherded in the right way. Husbands, love your wife and live with them in an understanding way. Serve them and love them. You're there to lead as Christ is the head of the church, giving yourself up. If there is one who must do sacrifice in the, in the home, guess who that person is? The men, the husband. Wives, serve your husbands and help them in achieving and in strengthening their mission. And help them and encourage them in going out into the world. And do not stop them. Children, serve your parents as in the Lord. Serve your brothers and your sisters, your siblings. For that is pleasing in the sight of God. But now it is necessary that we give a clarification. For in all of this... The Lord does not call his disciples, so he doesn't call us to a mere external obedience. I do not call children only to obey just because of the sake of obedience. I do not call one another to obey only for the sake of obedience. I call every one of us to obey because we have been regenerated from the inside out. True obedience, it is obedience that comes out from a new heart. Hebrews 11.6, for without faith, you can do nothing that pleases the Lord. It is a new heart that is brought forth from the gospel that can obey this calling. This is a supernatural call to overcome the innate selfishness of our hearts. And now how can you have, how can you do this? How can you serve one another dying to yourself, which is counterintuitive? It is because of the transforming power of the gospel. Isaiah 53, verse 10. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. He shall carry, care, care, carry the he shall make the many righteous. The servant king, by giving his life, he brings forth 
servant kings and queens after his own heart. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. Seeing a people that has his own heart. Seeing a people that has a heart of flesh that beats for God, for Christ, and for one another. A new regenerated people. A new creation beaming forth from the tomb of Christ, the risen King. Brothers and sisters, this is a call to trust in the Lord and to obey Him out of the new heart. It is the cross of Christ and it is the resurrection of Christ which empowers the people of Christ to follow Christ, to follow Christ. It was not until Pentecost that this bunch of teenager boys who stopped competing with one another. When the Lord Jesus Christ poured out on his church the promise of the Holy Spirit, which was the promise of the Old Testament, the promise of the New Covenant, and he sent forth the Holy Spirit, and now those 12 were changed, different, empowered to do the will of God, which is self-sacrificial leadership. That what produces servant kings. The death of the servant king who rises again and with him brings many into glory which is to come. Let us pray. Father, for the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all people teaching us to renounce ungodliness and worldly living and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age as we look for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us, Lord, to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Oh God, help us to be that kind of people that you sent your son to die and rise for. In his name we pray. Amen.